Um, stigma is a thing. Uh, the theme for the didactics during this 2019 are going to be to focus on um, areas that I think are very high yield in terms of if we can solve this problem, we can unlock a lot of potential for recovery, both for the individual patient and um, at scale, you know, for say people with this illness in the state of Ohio or in the world. Um, and I, I think start, start, starting point of stigma is a good place. Um, so I'm going to discuss the possibility that we're all, um, on average, more pessimistic about schizophrenia than the data says that we need to be. Uh, I'm going to talk about where that comes from. I'm going to try to suggest to you the, the reality that a whole lot of what determines both the presence of the illness and its outcome are things that, in fact, an individual has control over. So I, ca I coined the term actosphere uh, to, to describe the sphere of things in which um, personal activity can affect outcome. And we'll highlight through this, you know, um, the, the, what, that there's a mismatch between what scientists or psychiatrists typically have focused on, which is presence of hallucinations or delusions, um, versus what people with the illness really want, which is friends, a family, a place to live, and some fun time in life. Um, so, uh, Again, to the re highlight, this is a very important topic because this is, represents a key impediment to recovery, and it's something that we in the profession historically have actually actively contributed to, and we in the profession um, are well poised to, to um, make uh, to make dense dense into it. Um, so. Stigma, I mean, I can tell you stigma is, is associated with poor outcomes, but here are some studies which just nail down different facets of the poorness of the outcome. Um, people who have um, internalized attitudes of stigma um, will not respond, it will not adhere to treatment, they won't even show up to the clinic. Um, they have low morale, lower outcomes, and lower quality of life, um, and, and they, they don't ask for help. Uh, this leads to what I'll set up as a vicious circle. Um, because of stigma, people have poor outcomes or don't even show up for treatment, which means that a lot of people with this illness do poorly. Um, and then we can all look around and see people with schizophrenia who are doing poorly and conclude that these attitudes that I was taught in medical school or read in textbooks um, about schizophrenia being a dire diagnosis must be true because look at all these people who are doing badly. I'll argue that a lot of those people who we think are doing badly um, are doing badly because they're poorly adhering to treatment, not showing up to treatment, and so forth because of stigma. Um, so Patrick McGorry um, is a name that I hope that many of you may recognize, but for those who don't, he's kind of the founder of the movement of intervening in early psychosis. He's an Australian psychiatrist, um, set up the first large-scale early intervention programs. Uh, McGorry, you know, writes what I, as I think about this, um, he and I came to same, the same conclusions independently, that a lot of what we think represents the dismal outcome of schizophrenia actually is not due to the illness itself, but is because of the things that we built around it. Um, late detection, uh, the fact that as the case was, as today's case, the young man was admitted to the hospital scared out of his wits against his will, and he was giving a medicine which gave him a horrific side effect. Um, crude and reactive pharmacotherapy. What's the odds that he's going to be engaged as a result of that? Well, you saw. Um, so, and the fact that he showed, I mean, at any rate, um, that's the case today is illustrative of this. Um, uh, top, uh, on top of that, um, we know for a fact that schizophrenia affects multiple domains of functioning um, in the psychosocial and relationship sphere. Yet, where are the services which are targeting the psychology, the social support, and so forth? It's, it's uh, bare bones. So uh, we, you know, we get bad outcomes because we have bad, bad, we get bad outputs because we have bad inputs. Um, so the question now, is stigma a thing amongst physicians or medical professionals? And sadly, it is. Um, it turns out that studies of stigma, stigmatizing attitudes amongst, amongst healthcare professionals show that on average, um, healthcare professionals have at least as much stigma um, uh, around a severe mental illness as the general public. That's because we come from the general public. Um, and uh, and this is this is evidenced um, in actual lower quality medical care. People with schizophrenia are less likely than people without to have screenings like mammography or uh, or osteoporosis. And 
amazingly, uh, the fact that despite the fact that we routinely prescribe the medications which tend to worsen their blood cholesterol and lipids and cause weight gain, people with schizophrenia are less likely than people without to be referred for cholesterol monitoring or weight loss programs. Um, on top of that, uh, if you go into an emergency room or a clinic and say, or it's attached to you, my diagnosis is schizophrenia, there is a great likelihood that whatever your chief complaint is, shortness of breath, is going to be ascribed to your diagnosed to your, to your mental illness. Um, he's anxious because of schizophrenia, so he can't breathe. Uh, this is called diagnostic overshadowing, and it's a thing. Uh, it's a bad thing, but it's a thing. And what about uh, amongst people in the mental health profession? You know, are we immune to this? Sadly, no. Um, the, the bulk of the data says that um, on average, I'm sure that all you who are you know, listening to this don't harbor stigmatizing attitudes, but on average across large samples, uh, people in the profession tend to have as much stigma as people outside. And concerningly, some studies actually suggest that there are pockets within the profession where stigmatizing attitudes are more prevalent and more severe than those that are in the general public. Um, clearly, this is a situation that we need to change, but rather than say, like, wag the figure and say, bad people, uh, you have these attitudes, let's like look at why. Why might we have such, so, such a degree of stigma around this illness? Uh, first, you know, we come from a culture and shiny light on the culture. Where do we talk about schizophrenia and psychosis? I mean, just today, if I go to my email, I'll probably find some, something about a link to some new treatment for erectile dysfunction or for metastatic breast cancer or some breakthrough in diabetes or whatever. I mean, I'm inundated. Everywhere I go, I get, hey, here's a headline from health, health research news. I never get anything that says, here's some, you know, five facts about schizophrenia you didn't know, or early warning signs of what to do. I mean, the, the health media is silent on schizophrenia, uh, despite the fact that there are more people with schizophrenia than have diabetes type one, multiple sclerosis, or lupus combined. Um, and despite the fact that one in 10 Americans, one in 10 Americans will report during the course of their life a psychotic experience. Uh, so I call this the most common problem that nobody talks about. Um, so in the absence of an open, honest, uh, supportive, and non-stigmatizing discussion, in the absence, I mean, we can talk about erectile dysfunction on television, and we can't talk about psychosis, apparently, as a society. Um, so in this vacuum of information, then you get prejudice and uh, stereotype and um, all sorts of other things. We ourselves in the profession um, tend to, you know, attach to language that we should change. Um, I belong to the American Psychiatric Association, but my association continues to perpetuate what I call crimes against humanity. Uh, one of them being that they still retain the term psychotic and schizophrenic. They changed everything else except for borderline personality disorder. Um, and we, in a manic depression no longer exists. Bipolar disorder, it's called. Dysthymia went away in DSM-5. Now it's persistent depressive disorder. So, I mean, they changed the language to sanitize it and everything else, but we still stick with an adjective that is used as a derogatory slur in our, in our common language. And schizophrenia derives from Greek words, which means splitting of the mind. It is both psychodynamically and anatomically inaccurate. We retain these terms. Um, this is a problem on us. Uh, and I go, no matter where I consult, which hospital I go into or clinic, I hear somebody talking in the back room about so-and-so having a psychotic break, a break from reality. We're going to hit them with this and put them down because they need to go to sleep. I and mean, we, we talk about people like they're animals um, behind closed doors. And so I encourage you, if you hear this, to try to gently correct things. So the language that is ingrained in our profession that we all grew up in actually contributes to stigma, I argue. Um, and worse, the worst of all is that, you know, I went to medical school in the 1990s and I studied residency stuff in the 2000s. And at that late date, I was still reading books that said schizophrenia is a permanent and a progressively deteriorating disorder. That was written in my textbooks in 2000. Um, and so I, of course, thought there's no hope for this disease. Um, and even the DSM, the American Psychiatric Association, I'm a member, so I feel I can criticize it fairly, um, in their biblical textbooks of psychiatric diagnosis, the DSM, they said, 
verbatim, 1980. Um, a return to premorbid functioning is so rare as to cast doubt upon the accuracy of the diagnosis. They have this attitude because it was originally defined as the illness from which nobody gets better. Um, a, a, a 19th century psychiatrist named Emil Kreplin came up with that concept. There is a disease which strikes early in life from which no one recovers. He called it dementia precox. Um, Kreplin actually found out that 13% of his patients that he said never recover got better. Um, and Kreplin just said, oh, I was wrong about them. They, don't, they didn't belong in that category. So it became, it was a circular, it was a tautology from the beginning. And we just learned people don't get better from schizophrenia. Worse than, we had these hospitals where we had no medications, we just had large places to house people is what they became. They started off actually with noble purposes, but they became big warehouses of ill. Um, they, people were socially isolated. They were, um, you know, basic needs were barely or not met. You don't get better in that kind of situation. Yet from 1900 to 1960, that was standard of quote unquote care. People got worse. So it reinforces this idea. Schizophrenia is the bad disease from which nobody recovers. Then we discovered Thorazine in many medicines. And so then we said, well, if 100 milligrams is good, let's give them 2,000 milligrams. Um, and so, you know, the so-called crude and reactive pharmacology happened. And then people, you know, got bad. They got horrible side effects, disabling side effects. They didn't want to go to treatment. So bad outcomes. So bad outcomes follow bad practice, and bad practice is what we had from 1850 to about 1990. So that's a whole lot of, you know, um, historical baggage to carry uh, with us, and that's why I think the field continues to harbor these very low expectations. Um, and I actually get criticized, like, a lot for saying that you should expect good outcomes from schizophrenia. Um, I get criticized because I'm giving false hope to people. I should apparently, according to my critics, uh, be telling people that, oh, you have schizophrenia, expect a very bad life, and to do, to do otherwise is somehow like setting unrealistic expectations and so forth. So, um, you know, I always say, great, you know, if you want to talk about reality, let's look at reality. Let's talk about what we might call reality-based expectations. Here's the reality, you know, evidence, you want evidence, here's the evidence. How often does recovery happen in schizophrenia? These are studies from the pre-neuroleptic era through the modern time. These are long-term studies using large sample sizes of 100 to 500 people from between five and 30 years. The column on the far right, the percent of individuals in the sample that were fully recovered or significantly improved between 46% to 84%. If you take the average of those numbers is about 65%. Two thirds of individuals in these samples recovered, or you know, uh, uh, they, they got a lot better, or they fully recovered. And recovery is a fuzzy concept. It usually means having a better quality of life, of meaning and purpose. Um, many of these studies use the criteria for recovery as able to return to their former position in society, able to maintain full-time employment, meaningful family relationships. I mean, these are not small potatoes in terms of recovery. That's reality. Um, but you know, the average, the average person, the average training, uh, doesn't hear this because we're supposed to tell people to expect bad things. So you might argue that recovery, well, recovery, that's just being able to live life. Okay. It doesn't mean freedom from symptoms. So let's take a look at that idea. Let's talk about freedom from symptoms, what we call remission. Remission, recovery is a more fuzzy concept. Remission actually has a more narrow concept or a more narrow definition. That is to have essentially scores of zero or close to zero on measures of psychosis according to standardized rating scales. Um, so, and not only to have these like absence of symptoms or near absence of symptoms, but to have that last for a significant period of time, six months or longer, is six months is the usual minimum bar to call somebody in remission. So just like this person with leukemia, there's no sign of active illness, the person is in remission, same in schizophrenia, no sign of active illness, and it's been stable for some time. Remission rates, from more modern studies in the middle column, you know, the, you'll see that the years followed are shorter. Um, the lowest of the estimates was 33%, so one in three people can have remission, and some estimates going up to 80%. If you take the average of all these studies, it's about half. Half of people with schizophrenia using these still relatively crude interventions um, were able to achieve Remission. Half of people with schizophrenia getting remission, two-thirds having recovery. 
Um, I would say that optimism in schizophrenia treatment is realistic. Um, I think it's enough realistic that we should uh, probably revise the first rules of medicine, at least for psychiatry purposes. So doctors are taught first do no harm, you know, the Hippocratic Directive number one. Um, I'm going to argue that psychiatry first establish hope um, and do, do anything that's going to negate hope. So. Uh, a lot of things that we can do, in addition, you know, we, we can make things better. So taking medicine, you know, finding medicine that you agree with, you know, practicing um, informed decision making uh, will result in adherence. Maintaining the dose at levels which, you know, uh, produce recovery and not side effect maintains adherence. Um, helping our patients to, you know, look beyond medication and uh, affecting attitudes toward illness and treatment. Um, supporting the development of, so of meaningful social networks. Um, supporting the uh, return to school or work, um, encouraging physical activity. Everything else that you and I would do to say, you know, makes a good life is the same for people with this illness. Uh, we just need to, to deliberately incorporate this as part of treatment because, you know, because it works, because it works, and because are things, these are things that we can control. So we should, you know, the, the basic, the basic uh, premise of, of treatment in this, in this illness is Anything that you can control that may result in better outcome, you should work to control it. You know, do everything that you have in your power. And we have a lot of levers that we can easily push. So um, I assert that all times and everywhere, aim for full recovery. Uh, make that part of your personal mission and the uh, mission of your, your, your treatment settings. Um, I call it the culture of unrelenting optimism. Uh, which is a big stretch for a lot of a lot of um, care organizations to try to embrace because it it, it goes against literally a century of um, expectation, um, and also it's difficult in modern in modern settings because we built thanks to these you know hundred years of of error we have built systems of care we've built insurance reimbursements and rates and stuff that basically say we're locked into a system which is generally um, geared toward keeping people from killing themselves. Uh, we ought to be building systems which actually really, you know, are geared toward full restoration of recovery. So you're going to find a lot of, you know, impediments. And so on an individual level, you know, go to the wall. Recovery is what the, is, 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 is recovery is the goal and don't stop until you get there on the individual clinician to patient re relationship. Bigger thing, you, and if we do this religiously and at scale, we will change uh, the culture of stigma.